Well, good morning to you and welcome to Morning Mail. Today is Monday, the 23rd of May, 2022. Good to be with you this morning. Apologize for being just a few minutes late. I was uh, busy working on some other things and did not keep an eye on the clock. Anyway, good to be with you today. Glad you're here. Let's start with prayer and then we'll get right back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Would you bow with me? Gracious Father, we thank you so much for the day and its blessings for the past night's rest. Thank you for the activities of this weekend, in particular yesterday on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, the opportunities of Bible study and worship. And we pray, Father, that as we participated in those things, that you were honored and glorified that we truly remembered the death of Jesus and the sacrifice that he made in the communion. And we just pray, Father, that you uh, were uplifted, or that we were uplifted as well. Thank you now for this time that we can come together on this Monday morning for the opportunity of this uh, morning mail devotional each weekday morning. And I pray, Father, that you would bless us in our time together. Thank you for the ones who are able to take time each day to come spend a few minutes in your word. Continue, Father, to be with those that are on our prayer list that we've been mentioning from time to time. You know all of them and you know all of their circumstances. And we pray your blessings continue to be with them. Be with our world. We know you're in charge, that you bring up, set up kings and bring down kings. And we just pray, Father, that uh, things will soon turn to a, a better way and turn toward you. Thank you for the Christ. Thank you for the Bible. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, Paul had just concluded the section in which he spoke of the fundamentals of the gospel under the heading of the mystery of godliness back in chapter 3, verses 14 to 16. Then in chapter 4, verses 1 to 5, he described the marks of those who turn away from the faith and give heeds to, quote, deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons, end quote. In view of these dangers to the Lord's church, and in view of Timothy's work among the local congregation at Ephesus, Paul now turns to some very personal instructions for Timothy. The remainder of 1 Timothy 4 forms a unit containing this personal admonition to the young preacher. The conduct of a preacher is of interest to the congregation where he labors as well as to the preacher himself. Paul's admonition to Timothy here might well be compared to Paul's description of how he himself behaved in a similar situation while working with the congregation in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and following. Let's read and consider first 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. Paul says, quote, In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine, which you have been following, but have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness, for bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Now Paul tells Timothy that if he admonishes the brethren by telling them the things which he has been, Paul has been writing about, that is the apostasy and its dangers and the mystery of godliness, then Timothy will prove to be, quote, a good servant of Christ Jesus, end quote. 
This shows that Timothy's work as an evangelist at Ephesus concerned itself with the local congregation, as well as with concerning itself with those outside of the congregation. Now notice also here, Paul used the term servant, New American Standard that I read from. The King James uses translates this word as minister to designate the function of Timothy as a preacher of the gospel. Now, this is in line with its use by the apostles, according to Luke in Acts 6, verse 4. There, there, is a, there a distinction is made between the technical use of the word in serving tables and the ministry of the word, to which the apostles said they would devote themselves. A minister of the word or a minister of the gospel is certainly a term uh, or, a, or a use of the term uh, distinct from the ordinary uses of the word to denote Christian service in general. There is a ministry which consists of testifying of the gospel of the grace of God. Acts 20, 24. Paul adds that as a minister, Timothy is to be, quote, constantly nourished, end quote, or sustained, quote, on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine, end quote, which Timothy has so far followed. Now, the faith and sound doctrine are both objective and mean the gospel, the system of faith and doctrine revealed by Jesus Christ. The next advice in verse 7 is to, quote, have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for women, end quote. Fables could also be translated myths. This refers to the philosophical heresies behind the prohibitions regarding marriage and food in verse 3 of chapter 4, especially the assertion that all matter is evil. These fables and are worldly, rather, meaning that they are totally worldly and therefore pointless and worthless. Now, Paul said that these perversions were, quote, fit only for women, end quote. Many of us are familiar with the expression, old wives' tales a phrase that encompasses everything from health advice like feed a fever and starve a cold to behavior modification. Keep making silly faces like that and one day your face will freeze that way. It's a, so that's similar to the term that Paul uses here in, from his day to label sayings with little or no substance our value. Timothy was to have nothing to do with them. Now, at first glance, this may strike us as strange, because Paul has just told Timothy to point out error. How could he do that and still have nothing to do with it? <coughs> well, Paul seems to be telling Timothy, once you point out error to the brethren, Move on to more positive teaching. Do not allow yourself to become sidetracked. To use another figure of speech, he was saying, in effect, do not get bogged down in the marshlands of error. Set your feet firmly on the solid truth of the gospel. You know, from time to time, warnings are necessary, but the Emphasis should be on imparting truth. There is no greater safeguard against error than a thorough knowledge of God's Word. In speaking of Timothy's being nourished by the Word, in verse 6, Paul had already said that it was important for Timothy to stay strong spiritually if he was to successfully combat error. He expands on that thought in verses 7, 8, and 9. 
On the one hand, Timothy was to have nothing to do with worldly fables, which would tear him and the brethren down. But on the other hand, verse 7b says he was to discipline himself for the purpose of godliness, which would build both him and the brethren up. And that word translated discipline is in the present tense, indicating that it was a continuing action. As he often did, Paul used athletic terminology. Discipline means exercise, train, undergo discipline. It involves the type of disciplined training program undertaken by a dedicated athlete. Now, of course, Paul is not thinking about a physical training program, but rather a spiritual training program to develop godliness. In verse 8, Paul contrasted bodily exercise with spiritual exercise. Regarding bodily exercise, he says it, quote, is only of little profit, end quote. Now, this leaves the impression that bodily exercise has little or no value. The Greek text has uh, no word in it for only. It literally reads, Bodily exercise is profitable for a little. In other words, it's of some profit. You know, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. Also see Romans 12, verse 1. Part of our stewardship is to take care of our bodies. Paul does not spell out what should be included in this discipline. The best general advice is to read God's Word, study God's Word, live God's Word. Now, we could also list specific spiritual activities such as praying, attending Bible classes, and worship, serving God and man, and sharing our faith with others. To be spiritually beneficial, these must be done with regularity. What would we think of an athlete who said, well, running does not help me. I ran around the track once and I, I am not any faster. Serious self-examination is required. See 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. So what are your areas of spiritual weakness? Give thought and prayer to a spiritual exercise program to develop yourself in those areas. Then stick with that program. In so doing, you will be built up in Him. Colossians 2, verse 7. Well, why is this important? The answer is found in the latter part of verse 8 here in 1 Timothy 4, where Paul wrote, quote, Godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. When Paul said that godliness holds promise for the present life, he's, he was not implying that being godly will guarantee a bigger house or exemption from problems in this life. He was saying that living a godly life can have a positive effect on so many things in this life, including our health, our marriages, our families, and yes, even perhaps our businesses. He especially was emphasizing 
that it can help our outlook on life because God-centered Christians are not dependent on favorable outward circumstances for happiness. He also says godliness holds promise for the life to come. In that home of the soul, where God will wipe away every tear, where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. Revelation 1 verse 4. Godliness blesses us now and prepares us for eternity. Faithful, godly Christians have the best of both worlds. Now in verses 9 and 10, we have the third appearance in the letter to Tim, in 1 Timothy of the phrase, trustworthy statement. Having mentioned the life to come in verse 8, Paul said, for it is for this we labor and strive. Verse 10a. That word labor indicates exert oneself, work hard, toil, strive, struggle, laboring to the point of exhaustion. Strive is from the same Greek word from which we get our English word agonize. Both words reflect the intense exertion of a dedicated athlete. Paul's emphasis in verse 10 is on the focus needed to excel in sports, but more particularly in Christianity. Fixed our hope is from one word in Greek which has the sense of looking forward to something with confidence. It is followed by the Greek preposition, preposition meaning uh, indicating the ground upon which our hope rests. Paul's hope, indeed our hope, rest not on dead idols which were present everywhere in Ephesus, but on the living God. God is the Savior, potentially, of all men, but especially or actually of believers. He offers salvation to all and saves those who come to him in faith and obedient trust in him and his Son. John 8, 24. Hebrews 5 verses 8 and 9 and Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Well, we're going to stop at this point and on Monday, uh, excuse me, not Monday, but tomorrow, Tuesday's morning mail, I want us to begin considering the next section of 1 Timothy 4 and that is verses 11 through 16. Hope you can be with me then. Let's close our time this morning on morning mail with prayer. Gracious and loving Father, we are again in deep gratitude for the privilege of being able to come into your presence as your children in prayer and petition. And Father, we just pray your blessings upon us as we seek to follow and to do your will that we might exercise ourselves spiritually, that we might hold to the truths of the gospel that have the promise of this life and more particularly the life to come. May we be ever students of your word and follow the teachings and the readings that we find. Thank you for the Bible that reveals your will and makes known to us the course, the path that we must follow. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. Well, go out. Make your Monday a great one. Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock with more Morning Mail. See you then.